Good evening and it's lovely to welcome you along to this online midweek Bible teaching and prayer time. Just to remind you if you're not already aware that we are back meeting in the church hall on a Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock for Bible teaching and prayer and we would love you to be able to join with us. We're conscious that under the current situation that folk are not perhaps as busy as they once were, particularly in the evenings. And this may well be the opportunity for you to engage with us in what is central to the life of the church, our services of worship and our times of prayer. So let me encourage you in that. If you're unable to be out with us for whatever reason, if you're still uh, isolating and so on, then I trust that these online midweeks will continue to be a means of encouragement to you. We're stepping back again to use the skills and talents that God has blessed Dr. Sinclair Ferguson with uh, to listen over these next few weeks at individual addresses that he gave at different conferences. Now they are perhaps slightly longer uh, than what we may be used to but i firmly believe that if you are listening you will find that you don't notice the time uh, passing and we trust that that will be a blessing to us. And this evening he is speaking on Christ's message to the church and he's taking the first of the seven letters in Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 to 7 as his theme. But more of that in a moment. For now, let's join together in worship of God as we sing our opening praise, The Church's One Foundation.
Well, let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty, eternal and ever-blessed God, as we come into your presence yet again to give you the worship and praise that is yours, we thank you that our opening praise has indeed reminded us that the church is built on that one foundation, that rock, which is Christ Jesus. We rejoice, O Lord, that he is her head, he is her Lord, he is her Saviour, he is her guide, her keeper, her friend. And we thank you that he represents the church even at your right hand in glory as the first fruits of those which slept. And we rejoice that because he is there, the promise given us that where he is there we shall be also, shall one day be fulfilled in us also. We come together this evening to worship you, Lord. We're thankful, Father, that we, by your wondrous grace, are members of that same church. It is you that has sought us out and found us. It is you that has drawn us to yourself, planted the seed of faith within us and enabled us to believe in Jesus Christ for our salvation. It is you that has begun the good work in us and is resolved to carry it through to completion. It is you who has kept us day and daily, walking in the way. It is you who has restored us on those times when we have strayed from that narrow way. Father, it is you who has kept us and shall keep us. So with John Newton of old we can say, "'Tis grace has brought me safe this far, and grace will take me home." It is you that is deserving of our praise, our adoration, our service. Lord, we look to you this evening. We look to you, O Lord, because you alone are the one who can help us, strengthen and encourage us. You're the one who alone can remove our fears and our doubts and our anxieties and replace those with your wonderful peace. And so may the ministry of your word into all our lives this evening be one that is blessed and through which we ourselves are greatly encouraged. So, Father, we look to you to grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit, that he might be our teacher, enlightening our minds again in the things of your word. And we ask this in and through the precious and worthy name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we hand over to Dr. Sinclair Ferguson, who was speaking at one of the Ligonier conferences uh, in uh, Orlando, Florida, uh, just a few years ago. Now the theme this morning, this afternoon, Christ's message to the church. I realize many people come to conferences without bothering to look at the program. So, for those of you, let me tell you what was on the program, and that was that the remit given to me was to choose one of the letters from Revelation chapters 2 and 3 to select that letter as though Christ were speaking to the Christian church in the West. In many ways, those letters are really prescripts. They were intended to be read by all of the churches, and uh, it must have been quite something as the book of Revelation made its way, perhaps just one copy, each church making a copy as it made its way along there in Asia, and as one church and another heard what Christ thought of the other churches. You can't help wondering how they must have felt as they realized that Christ had already taken the X-ray of their church, and others would hear it. Ligonier does very few things without giving secret challenges to the speakers, and uh, this particular address allotted to me came with the secret challenge. Uh, which, if I was willing to accept it, the tape would self-destruct in 30 seconds. And that was to choose one of these letters, one of these prescripts. 
The, the difficulty in doing that, of course, is that your choice probably indicates what you think about the church, doesn't it? Uh, just think about it. There are seven of them. Which one would you choose? You would choose the one that said what you thought about the church, because that's what you think Christ would be saying to the church today. And so I've chickened out, <laughs> and I'm going to deal with the first of them, which you will find in Revelation chapter 2, first seven verses written to the angel of the church in Ephesus, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember therefore from where you have fallen Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. The book of Revelation is in many ways best understood as the movie version of Matthew 16, verse 18. Matthew 16, verse 18 is best understood as the consummation of the promise that God gave in Genesis 3.15. And the whole of the Old Testament story is simply an unpacking of that fundamental verse, that throughout the ages until the coming of the singular seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, there would be conflict between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, until Satan himself, the serpent, would seek to crush the heel of the seed, Jesus Christ, and in the process, His head would finally be crushed. Jesus says, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the seed of the serpent, will seek to overcome it, but be unable, because I will build my church. And in the picture of the church's history that's given to us in the book of Revelation, the serpent of the Garden of Eden has grown large, as John tells us in Revelation chapter 12, into the size of a monstrous red dragon, who having failed to devour the Christ child who was born to rule the nations of the world, would then go on in pursuit of those who belonged to the Christ child and seek to engulf them. And in some ways, these prescripts to the book of Revelation are the Lord Jesus' indication to these different city congregations of where they stand in that conflict. And the rest of the book of Revelation, because these churches are in very different situations, churches in different parts of the earth today would more identify with one of these churches than with others of those churches, but the whole book of Revelation is for all of those churches. And this is a marvelous illustration in itself in the grace of God how the one message of the gospel touches different churches at different points to bring them not only to conflict in the battle, but ultimately to bring them to victory in the battle, as we are told here in verse 7 to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is 
in the paradise of God. But there's a principle that runs through each of these letters. It's the principle that the apostle Peter enunciates, isn't it? That the time has come for judgment, discrimination, analysis to begin at the house of God. And I suspect Peter draws that from the prophecy of Ezekiel. You remember as Ezekiel sees in these visions into what is really happening in the church in Jerusalem and sees that the real problem is not the external forces on the church, but the internal spiritual decay in the church. And he sees judgment beginning, literally in the house of God, and then this vision of the glory of God leaving the house of God and departing. And this, of course, is the very principle that Jesus applies here, that unless the church in Ephesus repents, then He will remove the candlestick, the symbol of the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And the church in Ephesus would therefore be no more. You and I, my guess is, are far better at analyzing the world than we are at analyzing the situation in our own churches. If I may say so as an insider-outsider to the conservative Christian community in the United States, Many of us have been far too good at analyzing what is wrong with the culture and far too myopic in analyzing what is wrong with the church. But whether this is the letter that applies to us, or whether once we have read this letter we would listen to the other letters, it is of the very essence that we listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches, and especially what Jesus Christ Himself is saying. I have five things to say on the basis of this passage, and we will just see how many of them we manage to get through. But first of all, I want you to notice, and this is hugely significant, how Christ presents Himself to the church in Ephesus. You notice in the vision that John has of the Lord Jesus in the first chapter, he is described in a multifaceted way. But then in each of these letters, the Lord Jesus points to one particular dimension of His person and ministry, as though to say, in your situation, there is an aspect of my ministry to which you need to pay particular attention. And interestingly here in the prescript to the church in Ephesus, what Jesus draws attention to is that He is the one who holds the stars in His right hand and He walks among the candlesticks. The stars are the angels of the churches, perhaps as many commentators think the the leadership of the church. He holds them in His hands, and He walks among the candlesticks. It's It's a remarkable picture, actually, of the way in which the one, the Son of Man, of whom we sing of His bleeding hands and His wounded feet that now those wounds made glorified above are hands that hold the ministry of the gospel in the churches of Jesus Christ, and those feet move among the churches, discerning, testing, probing. And the essential principle that he is expounding here, isn't it, to the church in Ephesus, is that the church is his. He is its Lord. And in saying that, he is underscoring what I rather imagine in the Western Christian church, and not least in the Reformed Western Christian church. He is underlining how easily we fall from asking the question, 
What does Jesus Christ really want? Some of you belong to sessions or leadership groups in your churches, however they are named in the particular grouping that you have. Is it the single most frequently asked question, or at least in your minds, what does Jesus Christ want here? Or only, what is it that Jesus Christ agrees with me about wanting that I want here? And this was so clearly in the church at Ephesus that had seen so much of what Jesus Christ wanted and would produce, yes, at a cost. But now they are beginning to drift, and what Jesus Christ wants becomes incidental. Those of you who followed Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones' expositions of the book of Romans will remember when he comes to the exposition of Romans chapter 3 and arrays the whole of mankind before the judgment seat of God so that every mouth may be shut and the whole world held accountable before God. He pauses, I can almost hear him doing it, and saying, here is my definition of a Christian. A Christian is a man whose mouth has been shut. But my dear friends, you wouldn't get that impression meeting every Christian you know, would you? Not even when the issue is, what does Jesus Christ really want for His church? Because He has told us in the Scriptures that we are so enculturated in our world that we decide what pleases Jesus Christ by what pleases us. We even, even in the Reformed Church, bring in the experts to tell us how well we are doing, how glorious our worship is. And the voice of Jesus Christ is never consulted. We are really speaking about what we enjoy and about what we are doing. And we are not really searching and seeking out the Scriptures to reflect with deep self-analysis and humility, Lord Jesus Christ, what do you want for the church? Because uh, one of the things that was clearly happening in the church in Ephesus, which was one of the three greatest churches in the world, set within one of the great centers of the Roman Empire, cultural center, one of the seven wonders of the world was in Ephesus. But what concerns the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ is that they seem to have ceased asking, what will please the Lord Jesus Christ? You dare not assume that is what pleases you, incidentally. And you can only find it out by probing the Scriptures, immersing yourself in the Scriptures, and constantly asking the Spirit, show us how this applies, Lord, how Your will is good and perfect and acceptable, because we consecrate everything to You to that end. And one of the obvious illustrations of that is just what I've said, that there are experts who will come and tell you that the worship in your church is outstanding. But they mean no more than you have a good choir and organist, band or orchestra, that your preacher is eloquent. Because there's only one who can tell you what the quality of your worship is. And He has told you in the Scriptures the measurements He uses of that quality. And that's one of the things that clearly concerns the Lord Jesus here. And He, he does that as He presents Himself to the church. He does that by telling the church in Ephesus what He knows about them. And there are things He commends. He commends them because they've persevered in the face of difficulty. Verse 2, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. 
and you, verse 6, hate the works of the Nicolaitans, a false teaching group in the first century, which I also hate. But uh, do you notice something here in this? In a sense, these are the things that Christians can do, aren't they? can stand firm against the foe. We can, we can smell false teaching at 20 paces, and some of us can shoot it in the eye at 50 paces, but there's something missing. And what is missing is that they have abandoned, he says, the love they had at first. And this particularly interestingly because uh, they'd had very special privileges. This was, actually I think this was the church that had the most privileged ministry of the Word in the entire history of the Christian church, bar none, since the days the apostles were in Jerusalem. And one might even go beyond that and say, even including that church. This was the church that had the eloquence of Apollos. This was the church in which the Apostle Paul had spent most of his ministry in terms of where did he spend a good chunk of time? He was three years in Ephesus. This is the place where he left Timothy to continue that ministry. The traditions of the early church pretty much guarantee to us that at some point the Apostle John himself also ministered in the church at Ephesus. In the providence of God, I've specialized in being called to churches where there have been famous ministers, without exception. Tremendous privilege. But you know, there's such a thing as vicarious spirituality. It expresses itself this way, so, so where do you go to church? What's your church? I sit under Steve Lawson's ministry or I sit under R.C. Sproul's ministry, or I sit under Alistair Begg's ministry. You must really be some Christian. <laughs> but it can all be vicarious, can't it? Biblical Christianity is not going to an assembly where the Word of God is preached. Biblical Christianity is being an assembly where the Word of God jumps out of the pulpit and starts running around the church and transforming people's lives. And the staggering thing about this particular church is it had this extraordinary tradition of ministry, and it had persevered and, and had struggled and in some senses conquered but it lost sight of the main thing. And it could die because of losing the main thing. More than that, Jesus could come along and remove its candlestick for loss of the main thing. And what was the main thing? It was the love they had at first. Now, how do we know what that love was? Well, we need to go back to the first, don't we? Here are some illustrations of what it meant for them to abandon the love they had at first. This is, what, this is what Christ has against the church, and this is the third thing I want us to notice. In early days, they loved the Word of God. That was the chief characteristic of this community. They loved the Word of God, they loved being taught the Word of God and they love the ministry of the Word of God. How do I know that? Because Acts chapter 19 tells us that Paul hired the lecture hall of Tyrannus, you remember? And uh, one long-standing manuscript tradition of the book of Acts says to us that he did this for five hours in the middle of the day for up to three years. And Christians gathered in Ephesus. It looks as though they gathered from other parts. And for three years, he poured the Word of God 
into them, and they loved it, and they grew. And the result was that the whole of Asia heard what the Word of God was doing. You ever puzzle over the expression that Luke uses in the Acts of the Apostles, that the Word of God grew? Now, that's false teaching, isn't it? The Word of God doesn't grow. It's given to us once. What does that mean? It means there was such a power and an acceptance of the Word of God that it seemed to fill and fill and fill and fill and keep on growing like that stone that ran down the mountain in the vision of the book of Daniel until it consumed these people, till they were like, you remember what Spurgeon said about John Bunyan, that if you pricked him anywhere, he would flow biblin. That's one of the rarest commodities in the Christian world, in the English-speaking world today. Most Christians have more Bibles than they know what to do with and know almost nothing of what is in them except a few texts. I am ashamed to say that is a broad experience the statistics tell out to us. And yet we think we have it, that perhaps there's never been a church like our church. I remember once a man telling me, don't you think this is the greatest church in all the world? I didn't have the heart to say no. I think the church I'm in is the greatest church in the world. I wonder if you understand what that means. Five hours a day for three years, and all he's doing is teaching them the Scriptures pouring the Scriptures into them. Now, transfer that to the church in the Western world. Yes, the Reformed church in the Western world. What kind of appetite do we have and what kind of diet are we being given? Yes, but we are a Reformed church. You know, I guess I'm old enough now to say this. I get weary of people telling me they are Reformed churches in the tradition of Calvin until they've answered this question. Do you have preaching every day of the week? Is the whole of Wednesday given over to prayer in the congregation, and does the congregation gather for prayer? Then you'll be a Reformed church. And yes, we live in… No, we don't all live within half a mile of Saint-Pierre in Geneva but how little we do in this area of feeding on the Word of God and loving the Word of God to be taught us. Yes, it's good to work that down in groups that are well-led, but, you know, there's a symbolic difference between what happens in the preaching of the Word and what happens in the small group. You can't help noticing it's even physical. In the small group, we're all sitting looking down on our Bibles and we're thinking hard to answer the leader's question, and then we're disagreeing, or we're not sure. And there is a symbolism in the fact that when the Word is being expounded to us, it's coming down to us. And even the person who is preaching it is under it and conscious he's under it, and this is God's Word, and we're all under it, and it's feeding us, and it's getting places that we could never be brought to in our Bible study groups as the Spirit strives with our spirits in the beautiful anonymity of a large company and and reveals things that have been hidden from us and probes places where we hurt and does the deepest counseling of the entire week. And again and again and again as the weeks pass and the months pass and the years pass, our lives are transformed by the Word of God. And this was something that looks as though the Ephesians had lost their love for. And of course, once you once your appetite begins to go, you lose your love for the food, and, and then you be think, begin to think your appetite is normal. 
My brothers and sisters, we have no idea whatsoever how abnormal our church life really is. Why do I say that? I say that because when I came to the United States, first of all, and visited churches and was handed the bulletin, two things I would look for. How frequently is the Word of God expounded to the people here? And correspondingly, is it very evident to me that this is a people devoted to prayer? Because the apostolic motto was, we will give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word of God. And there's 25 minutes on a Sunday morning. And in congregations, even congregations that think of themselves as reformed, the elders and the pastors know that people won't come out at night. And yet we leave saying it was wonderful. You know, if you're a young man and you leave an hour with a girl and think that was wonderful, you don't leave saying, is there any chance we could meet for an hour the same time next week and keep that up? You can build a relationship on that. And yet you see, we've no idea what's happening. We haven't seen it. We think we're normal. But we know the Scriptures so little. And if we're really honest, we love the Lord Jesus so little as well. That if someone put us into a room with no distractions and said, I just want you to sit there and think about the Lord Jesus for five minutes. Many evangelical Christians in the Western world would find that an enormous trial because we don't know five minutes worth of the Lord Jesus, because we don't know the Scriptures because our lives haven't been under the Scriptures, and uh, we think we're normal. And it's a surprise. We understand why Jesus would say that to those horrible liberals, but what if He's saying it to us? And what if the evidence is in our churches? that we are indifferent, actually, to the ministry of the Word. And what is the least attended meeting in most churches, if there is church, such a meeting? It's a meeting for prayer. And we build. And we want really sharp pastors, kind of Apostle Paul's plus mixed with John, you know, little touch of the eccentricity of Ezekiel would do us uh, very nicely. And, and we don't realize that we've maybe lost our first love. I read some time ago a letter that Peter the Venerable had written, who was the abbot of the great monastery at Cluny, and he wrote it to far more famous Bernard of Clairvaux. And he said, you know, Bernard, you know what your real problem is? You do all the things you think are difficult really well. You fast, you discipline, but you don't do the simplest thing well at all. You don't really love. Just think of that for a moment. It was apparently possible to say in these early centuries, see how these Christians love one another. That surely would be one of the, the singular effects of the ministry of the Word of God crushing our humility and building up our Christ-likeness, and the whole community would know. I've sometimes said to people, in, particularly in the United States, you know, we're desperate to make an impact on our society. Especially this is true of a somewhat larger church. And we're trying to do every conceivable thing to kind of touch society. Actually, there's a very simple thing to do. Cannot fail. You just come to church on Sunday night. You just come to pray whenever 
the leadership in the congregation says, pray. And I guarantee there'll be anywhere between three and a dozen messages on your cell phone and your home phone saying, where were you on Sunday night when I called? Where were you on Wednesday? And you just need to know two words, church and prayer. And you are likely to get the response, oh God. And then you are likely to be able to say, precisely. You don't need to be eloquent. The sheer radical counterculturalism of your life is going to make people start talking about what's happening in the church. And it really does all go down to this. One of the things apparently that had happened in Ephesus was that impact that was made because of the Word of God and its fruitfulness in the people's lives, the transformation of character made people talk so that the Apostle Peter in another context doesn't say, you know, what you really need to do is to ask people questions about whether they're going to heaven or not. He says, no, all you need to do is ask, answer the questions they're asking you. Why are people not asking us more questions? Why do we get up to some of the false jiggery pokery that sometimes isn't even honest with non-Christians to ask them our questions? Because apparently there's so little about our lives and our churches that would make them ask any question at all. And what lies at the bottom of that? If it's true, then it's surely that we've lost our first love. Maybe that was why Paul wrote to Timothy, whom he had left in Ephesus, as he says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says to Timothy, Timothy, the goal of our ministry is love, love for the Lord Jesus, love for His Word, love for His people, love for the lost, love for prayer, and love for His glorious appearing. And the Ephesians apparently had lost it. These words of Jesus remind me of that probably quite electric moment in the Gospels when there was the, the dinner in the family home of Simon the leper. And in the midst of it, uh, when you remember Jesus was so beautifully anointed, he turned to Simon who was complaining. He was actually critical of the love that someone else had shown to the Lord Jesus, actually, because it exposed him. And Jesus said to him, Simon, I've got something I need to say to you. And that's what Jesus was surely saying to this church too. So, how do we apply this in the fourth place? And uh, I think when I read this particular letter, but some of the others, I think to a friend I had who was a missionary in Turkey and was feeling unwell and had gone to uh, have an x-ray done. And just because of the medical system, uh, the, the radiographer had uh, given my friend the x-rays in a, in a brown envelope, and she, she got on to public transport to travel across town to, to, the, um, to the physician who would read and analyze them. And, and what the x-ray people didn't know was that she was herself a physician. And she opened up the x-rays. And her first thought was this, I am a dead woman. And here it's as though Jesus is coming and saying, before that stage is reached, let me tell you what I already see on your x-ray. Uh, there's a spot here, and I know what it means. It means you've lost your first love. And uh, 
my grace is no longer amazing to you. You don't have the appetite for the Word. For all the struggle prayer is, you don't love coming together to pray. I remember an elder in a church I served in Scotland. After he retired, he said to me, he was free now. He, he said to me, you know, he was, uh, he was in banking. He said, you know, sometimes at the time of prayer, I had to drag myself here. I admired that. But then I said to him with a smile, but Bobby, you never had to drag yourself home afterwards, did you? Because you see, in spiritual things, in relationship to Jesus Christ, there are pleasures that we never taste because we've never tried them. And astonishingly, in the United States of America, of all places, because we say in our heart of hearts they wouldn't work here. And the paradox is, uh, I think, that in perhaps the nation in all the world which has had the most enterprising spirit of we can do it. I come from a nation where the basic spirit has been, we've never tried it. <laughs> but you know, there is one Scottish malaise that so many churches actually suffer from. Prayer, we've never really tried that. When I came to the United States of America, to me the most astonishing thing, it was like, it was like entering a television set. In the supermarkets, the apples were four times the size. There were 45 more varieties. The buildings were enormous. The churches were vast. If I could have packed up some church plants and put them in my pocket and dropped them down anywhere in Scotland, people would have assumed that's the New Jerusalem. But the question that lay in my mind was this, how is so much of this being built when the Word of God is largely silent in the property? And how can all of this be built? And there seems to be so little passionate, intercessory, pleading prayer for the power of the Spirit, the Word of God, the transformation of lives, and the salvation of sinners. And I would say in my lifetime, the single most obvious difference between my teenage years as an early Christian listening to people pray and the present day is this, in those days, you never were with the people of God in prayer without them pleading for the salvation of sinners. And nowadays, you can go to many prayer meetings, and the only thing that there is pleading for is somebody's broken leg. And we become all so horizontal, haven't we? We would, we would die if somebody denied the Scriptures to us and said they aren't inerrant. But in practical terms, most of them could be errant, and we would know almost nothing about it because we neither read them nor love to have them expounded to us. And we don't pray that the Holy Spirit would come down upon the ministry of the Word and transform lives. Maybe this isn't the right letter, but just imagine that you're sitting there when uh, the messenger has moved on from Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamum to Thyatira, and you know, having heard Jesus' message to the church in Ephesus, you know that, that what this messenger is holding in the, in the scroll or in the papers in which the book of Revelation is written, you know inside that brown envelope is the x-ray of your church too. And you almost want to say to him, I know I almost want to say to him, would you go around the other churches first? 
because I need to take in what Jesus is saying to the church in Ephesus, first of all, before I'm really ready to hear anything He might say in particular to the church in which I'm in now. But you see, Jesus doesn't say this to crush us. He says this to bring us back. He knows the way to bring us back, our fallen spirits to restore. And so He says, if you're listening now, if you're listening, I want you to remember that first love. If, if your marriage is going wrong, isn't that what you do? Let, honey, let's get back to our first love and to repent and to do the works that you did at first. Otherwise, the candlestick's going to be removed. I first studied the book of Revelation as a teenager, actually, with the help of William Hendrickson's beautiful little commentary, More Than Conquerors. And I'll never forget, as a youngster, reading the chilling words with which his exposition of these verses ends when he says, there is no church at Ephesus now. The place itself is a ruin. That couldn't happen in the United States, could it? There were people living in North Africa for many centuries, loving the Lord Jesus. They'd had the greatest theologian in history. Actually, the two greatest theologians in the first five centuries of the Christian church, and more of them, they had all lived in North Africa now. You know what's in North Africa now? Islam. How do we understand that? We could understand it in terms of the rise of Islam, but that would only be half the story. The rest of the story is that Jesus removed the candlestick because nothing happens apart from the sovereign judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first love of our ancestors in this country, you know what that was for. My dear friends, there's no point in boasting about them unless you imitate their example was to give themselves over. Feed us the Word of God, they said to their pastors, and let us pray for the blessing of God. When I was a young man, I was serving a summer assistantship in, in the remote fastnesses of the Scottish Highlands, and I uh, became friends with a man who was, I think he was probably about 90. All his friends called him Dodo. And I remember Dodo taking me out to the back of his craft one afternoon and saying, I remember as a 14-year-old boy coming out here on a Sunday afternoon, and the grass had turned black. And it was the backs of the men who were prostrated in the ground, pleading for the divine blessing, as he put it. And I can still hear him say, and it came. That's what we need. And so we need to remember and to repent and to do the works and to begin to taste this promise that if you overcome in these areas, he will give to you to eat of the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. May He save us, my dear friends, before it's too late. May He increase our hunger for His Word. May He make us men and women of young people of prayer and build such character and churches that we will discover that we need to be ready to give an answer to those who are asking us. What has happened here? It happened once in Ephesus, and it happened no more. Whatever the Spirit is saying to the churches, let those who have ears hear. Our Heavenly Father, we pray as we bow before the wonder of Your Word and the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ 
that You would cover any words that might lead us astray from Him and empower all words that will point us to Him and His majesty and glory, cause us to humble ourselves before Him in order that He and we with Him may be in our churches, exalted by His grace. We pray it in His name. Amen. Father, speak your word into our hearts, even once the voice of this preacher has grown dim. Continue to search us, purify us, that we might be the people you call us to be. And so may grace, mercy, and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all now and evermore. Amen. Well, as we come together in prayer again, I trust that you have Uh, being able to access the prayer points both from PCI and our own local congregational prayer points. And as has been our practice over these um, months now, I will lead us in prayer, uh, touching on a number of these themes and then encourage you following uh, the benediction just to perhaps spend some minutes yourself in prayer for those things which are particularly upon your own heart and upon your own mind, which the Lord has given you as a burden to pray about. Let me encourage you to be much in prayer in these days. We're in a terrible situation and whilst people will be doing all they can to help us, we look to the Lord to be our help and our strength. Well, let us bow together in prayer. Let us pray. Our loving Father who reigns sovereignly over his entire universe And Lord, for whom nothing is outside of his control. We come humbly, reverently before you this evening, recognising, O Lord, that it is somewhat presumptuous of us to come, we who are creatures of dust and sinful ones at that, to come and make request of the one who is eternally glorious and infinitely holy. And yet, Lord, we only come because you have opened a way for us. And we only come because you have invited us to. 
and we only come because you have made provision whereby we might approach your throne of grace unafraid. That wonderful provision is in our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you we are clothed with his righteousness and when you look upon us you see him and his perfect obedience and Lord you see us in Christ. And so we come to you this evening with the many things that are upon our hearts and minds. And Lord, not least the concern that presses most in upon us and this current situation with the coronavirus. Lord, we are conscious that as a nation, numbers are rising. We're conscious, increased numbers admitted to hospital. Uh, we're hearing of, of deaths increasing again directly attributed to coronavirus and Lord we're conscious that humanly speaking we need to do things we need to be wise we need to be careful we need to shield we need to cover our mouths we need to do all those things that we've been advised to do but father our hope is not in man our eyes are lifted heavenward and we're crying out for mercy to our God Oh Lord, that you would look upon us. Oh Lord, that you would visit us. Oh Lord, that you would forgive us our many sins. Oh Lord, that you would look upon our selfishness and cleanse us. That you would look upon our greed and forgive us. Oh Lord, that you would renew us in spirit and in mind and in heart. That you would revive us again, oh Lord, that we, your people, might rejoice in you. And that, Lord, through the church, you might then touch our community, touch our province, touch our nation, touch our world. Father, we come humbly before you. Lord, we remember the work of the church as a whole, the engagement that we have as a church with different missionaries and mission organisations throughout the world. They continue to work on in spite of the challenges that COVID has brought seeking to share the good news of Christ and especially in these days when there is so much worry, concern and anxiety and all the platitudes of politicians don't seem to bring peace to people's minds. We pray that Lord people may look to the Lord of peace, to the Prince of Peace and find in him contentment and rest and a wonderful hope. We pray Lord for Elva we are so thankful for the provision that you are making for her, both in terms of her work for you and accommodation. And the thing outstanding now is her visa. And we pray quite specifically for that, that you would undertake uh, in overruling and that, that that might be settled and through before very long. We continue to pray for Paul and Anne. And Lord, Paul continues to monitor very closely the situation throughout Africa. And we're conscious that, Lord, COVID is not the only challenge they face because we continue to hear of attacks by militant groups. And Lord, many of your people are left uh, vulnerable to these attacks because so much time and effort is being put into uh, seeking to prevent the spread of COVID. So we pray for your people throughout Nigeria and indeed throughout Africa that you would watch over them and that Lord in the midst of all they're facing they may be a witness to their Lord and Saviour. Father we continue to pray for Jerry and her work with the literacy team. Thank you for the unity of heart and mind in that team and thank you Lord that though the communications are all done online Yet that is profitable and Lord it is helpful as they seek to ensure that materials are printed which are suitable for all the different cultures that they represent. Father we look to you as a church. We're conscious O Lord that the work of the gospel has not stopped just because everything else seems to have. And so as a church ever keep us looking forward and looking upward and pressing onwards and Lord knowing that your grace and strength will sustain us but we do particularly pray for the witness of the church even in this land we are thinking of church planting situations uh, where things have had to be put on hold we're thinking of churches that were vacant and have been calling 
ministers or churches that have just lost ministers and have become vacant. And Lord, these are strange days for circumstances like this. We have not been this way before. And so we're very much learning as we go. And we do very especially pray for Richard and Julie and for the girls over these next weeks as final plans are put in place for Richard's uh, call and instalment and ordination in Remelton and Kilmacrennan. Overrule in the practicalities of this and speak your peace into their hearts through these days. Father, we continue to remember all who serve you within the life of the church. And Lord, within our own congregation, we're thankful for the many people who are keeping contact with each other. The phone call, the cup of coffee, whatever way it is, just to encourage one another, to remind folk who perhaps are unable to be out, that they're not forgotten, they're not alone. And we're so thankful for all who have been exercising a wonderful ministry over these last months in that way. We pray that you would continue to encourage them. Father, we do particularly pray for that vast number of families who claim a connection with us. But Lord, for whom that connection is, is so, so frail and fragile. We pray that as we seek to engage uh, with them, even over these days, that Lord, your spirit would be already going ahead of us. And Lord, that he would be working in lives and that we may see a wonderful movement of your Holy Spirit in many of these dear folk uh, coming to recognise that Lord, there's much more to life than life itself. And we pray that there may be a crying out and a seeking after the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, as we come to you, we're mindful, O oh Lord, again of the needs of our own province, of our executive, of our uh, first minister, deputy first minister, decisions that they have to make. Lord, politicians have decisions to make that affect everything and Whilst we're thankful for all the advice of scientists and the medical men, Lord, we're conscious that, uh, Lord, politicians have to take other things into consideration. Not just uh, the health of a population, but, Lord, often that health is related to our employment and our mental health very much affected by that. So we're praying that, Lord, you would be gracious toward us in these days. Father, we remember those of our own fellowship who continue to be uh, restricted very much due to their own underlying health conditions. And we pray that they may be conscious of your presence, that they may find even through these online services uh, a means of encouragement and help in the things of God. And for us all, O Lord, that our eyes would be turned heavenward and fixed upon Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. And so, Lord, we commend to you those recently bereaved, those recently in the hospital, those undergoing tests at this very time. May you speak your peace into their hearts. May they know what it is to rest in you. And may they have that wonderful assurance that in living life we live for Christ. And even should we be called from this scene of time, we shall be with Christ, which is far better. Bless us. Then, as we continue to look to you through the remainder of this week, be glorified in our lives as we seek to live them out in the face of others. And we ask these things in and through the name and for the sake of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and evermore. Amen. Amen.